Welcome everybody. It's Keith Schaefer here. Welcome to the October issue of the Virtual Myth Metals Investors Forum. Uh, many of you might be seeing me for the very first time, though I think a lot of you know me from uh, my time previous to this with the Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin. But even before that, uh, from 1990 to 2008, I worked uh, in the mining sector, in the junior mining sector, helping companies raise money on the retail side and doing some investor relations work. So I, I cut my teeth uh, for a long time there before uh, I moved off to oil and gas after the crash. And now, of course, oil and gas are four-letter words, so I've picked up uh, coverage on a few gold companies again, and we've had great success here. And what I'm hoping to share with you today is uh, a, a little bit of info on, on how I'm looking at gold, uh, which is very complicated, of course. It's got uh, lots of cross currents and trends, and uh, I will try and tell you something today you don't know, but uh, most of you are quite dedicated investors, and so that might be a little more difficult. And I'm excited to show you a group of exploration companies today uh, that I think are very much under the radar, uh, have very low market caps, and then one royalty company that just got listed that has a crackerjack team that I think you'll be excited in. So uh, I think you all probably know the format here today much better than I do. So as you're aware, you can click on the hand icon at any time and there'll be an email pop up when you can send in a question during any of the presentations. So we won't actually get to those questions until all the presentations are done, uh, but certainly uh, Matt, the organizer here is gonna have all those uh, emails ready to go and he'll send them over to me and we'll get them ready to go for when that session starts here as we get closer to the end. So you do not have to wait until the end of the session to click on that hand icon. You can do that anytime and email in your question as they come into your mind. So uh, I don't wanna take up too much time here because I really wanna allow the companies the most time possible to explain their stories. So uh, when when I look at gold here, I, I look at uh, and say, how do we, how do we value gold? How do we uh, look at these stocks? And, and because so many of these stocks are truly just calls on the commodity, they go up and down with gold. Uh, I, I think we all here in the junior sector have a very strong handle on what to look for in the stocks, good teams, good structures. But when you look at gold as a macro commodity, uh, it, it, it's so unique in the world because it is money. And there's no other commodity in the world that is money in anywhere near the same way. Copper and oil don't really hold a candle to gold from that point of view. So when, when I look at gold, uh, and, and please forgive me if I have a few uh, hiccups here in my very first presentation. So I always tell my subscribers, you know, you gotta be careful with gold because it's, it, it's quite volatile. It, it, it goes up the stairs and down the escalator. So, uh, and yet when you look at, how gold trades versus other commodities, you wonder, wow, how is gold even not more volatile uh, up and down hundreds of dollars uh, every single year, just because on a percentage basis, most other commodities actually are much more volatile. And so, um, and then when you're looking to value gold, uh, there's long-term versus short-term. And, and again, I think that's where you see some of these cross currents get hooked up where sometimes gold makes sense. You go, oh, yeah, gold should be doing that right now. And then there's a lot of times in the market where you go, wow, why isn't gold doing this? And, and oftentimes that's just because, like I say, a lot of these different cross currents of, of factors are, are, are playing against each other. And it's just tough to say at any given time, which one is going to win. And the other, I think, obvious part in, in part of a subset of that really is, is how the Eastern countries, Asia views gold versus how the West views gold. Uh, almost diametrically opposite. And, and then we'll, we'll give a, I'll give a quick, quick idea here on what's up or, or down for juniors here in, in the near to medium term. So if I look at gold uh, and I say, why is gold not more volatile? Like I spent a lot of time in oil and oil is up and down so much every single year, like, uh, it, which is really crazy because, you know, over the last 40 years, demand for oil has actually been very steady. It's been going up about a million barrels per day per year for about 40 years. And, and so we're now at 100 million. We, we, well, we peaked out pre-COVID at, at about 100 million barrels a day. And now we're down to about 90 million barrels a day. But uh, if, if I was to show you a chart of uh, supply demand, it would be freakishly um, straight, straight up at a 45 degree angle almost. It's, it's, there's almost no volatility in supply demand for oil in the last um, 
sorry, on demand in the last 40 years. And yet the price goes all over the map every single year. It's, it's, it's honestly rare to see oil not have a 30% move each quarter now. So uh, when you look at uh, how the fundamentals for gold go up and down so crazy, it, it's kind of remarkable the price stays as constant as it does. So you, you just look at over the last decade where investment demand for gold up until a couple of years ago uh, dropped 800 tons, like that's huge. And then uh, again, that, that, that's more on the Eastern side of, of the globe in, in Asia. And yet the ETF demand is even more volatile. That fluctuated almost 1,500 tons over a three-year period here. And again, that, that's mostly Western money. So uh, North America, Western Europe. So you, you get um, this appearance of what I consider remarkable stability in, in price, given the, what the fundamentals are. Uh, so you get this, this, this stable looking price, but uh, under the surface, there's an incredible amount uh, of activity going on with many different cross currents. So I, th I think uh, long-term gold's uh, a, a very simple trade. It, 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 it trades with liquidity and the more liquidity we have, and of course we all think about this. And, and so with all the stimulus we've had in the last little while, of course it trades, uh, gold should be trading up because we've had huge stimulus coming in with all the COVID action that we've seen this year. But over the short term, gold is very complicated. And again, I, I, I think that's, again, just speaking to all the cross currents that go back and forth between gold. So, um, and none of these factors or very few of these factors ever act in unison. So uh, what that does is it, it, given how strong these forces are, it is in my mind, remarkably, uh, it is just remarkable how, how gold seems to have very, uh, straightforward trend lines with a little bit of volatility, but nowhere near as much as, as, I, as, as it could given what the underlying fundamentals are, are happening. So East versus West, again, East, the East buy, Asia buys gold for jewelry, West buys gold for investment. You, like just look at the, that jewelry demand, like China and India obviously take up a huge amount of jewelry demand. Like it, it, it's the, the US and Western Europe are, 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 are barely even a, a big toe compared to the body of Asia. It's, it's, it's like, uh, there's just no real interest in um, the western part of the world versus the eastern for gold as, as jewelry. And yet ETF is, is the complete difference. Uh, ETF inflows, there were 734 tons the first half of this year. And that's the highest half year increase ever. And of course, the second was 2009, which is, you know, gold was in just the beginnings of a fabulous run there for the next two years up until March 11. So, uh, you know, hopefully that's a very positive sign for gold. So uh, you, you've got two diametrically opposed factors here. Uh, and certainly what, what happens is the higher the price of gold goes, the more the West wants to buy it and, and put money into an ETF and the less Asia wants to buy it for jewelry demand. So again, you've got these two very large factors in gold that seem to be diametrically opposed. And is one of the reasons we don't see gold being more volatile. So what are we seeing here now in the stocks, in the juniors? Well, actually we're seeing a, a kind of a microcosm of, of what's happening in the real market where you see in the, in the overall big board, uh, the Dow, the S&P, where the FANG stocks, the big five are really uh, taking up more weight in the index than ever before. And, and, and the, the, the reward for being number one is huge. The, 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 they're unicorn stocks. They, they have a massive valuation compared to everything else. And what we're seeing in the gold sector is the large producers are valued much higher right now than the smaller ones. And, and you're seeing, uh, there's lots of reasons for that. Obviously in, in, in gold, you have quite a difference in uh, AISC, all in sustaining costs and NPV numbers. Uh, jurisdiction plays a huge role in valuation now, I think much more than ever before. So and of course, just um, in the big companies, the ETFs buy the big companies, right? They don't buy the small companies. So it's quite a bit difference in demand for the stock. Uh, and of course, despite the fact that production has been flat across the globe for a while, uh, there's lots and there's lots of incentive for there to be takeovers. There hasn't been this year because you can't go meet the other management teams. You can't go visit the properties. So it's... Uh, due to COVID. So that's been a, a reason I think that we're not seeing quite as much demand on these juniors. 
and uh, it is pretty stark difference. Like you get 10 to 14 times cash flow for the really uh, celebrated companies. And again, one of the other things here that I that doesn't get reported very often is you know if you, if you've got a management team that's done really well in the past and has delivered shareholder gains, they're just going to get a much better valuation from the market. And it's very difficult for most analysts to in print quantify that. So, uh, you know, even though we talk about the assets here and the jurisdiction and, and the hard numbers as to why a stock trades where it does, there's quite a, a big piece of, of esoterics of, of, of the soft valuation. What does the street think of the team? And what have they done in the past? And that kind of gets priced in and there's no real way to look at numbers and figure that out. Everyone says, oh, this stock is much cheaper than its peers. Well, there's always a reason for that. So um, when you look down at the, at the lower echelons here, you're seeing a lot of the explorers and developers raising big, big cash now. It's pretty regular to see anywhere from five to $10 million raises now for the first time in years. Or I think the record here is by Benchmark, uh, who I don't really cover Benchmark Minerals, they just raised 50 million bucks. I've never in my 30 years, I've been in this business since 1991, never seen a junior raise $50 million for a BC asset, no less. So that's, that's uh, pretty remarkable. So of course, what that means is that all these uh, financings have four month holds and the, the big wave of financing started in July and, and is just really only started to slow down now. So that means the next four months, the market's gonna see lots of cheap paper coming due. So everyone's gotta be kind of aware of that. And also, uh, you know, our industry overuses warrants uh, way too much, particularly at the lower level financings where uh, warrants are supposed to be an incentive to get you to come in, whereas you know, when it's cheap stock, no one needs an incentive in a bull market. So uh, you just have to be very aware of, of how much paper is coming due. So I think that there is a possibility that uh, we could see a pause in some of these juniors uh, stock runs that we've all enjoyed so much in the last uh, nine months, just as, as we start to see how the drill results are going to be coming in. And four of the five companies that uh, I'm going to be showing you this morning, uh, they're drilling now and they're going to have results in very quickly and we're going to see how things develop. So uh, there'll be a lot of chance hopefully to recycle money and, and get ready for the next round of, of funding uh, as we get closer to PDAC. And so that's really all I was going to talk about gold today. Uh, I want to, again, get to these companies as quickly as possible and allow you to hear from them what their plans are. Uh, our, our first speaker today is Michelle David, CEO of Walker River Resources, symbol WRR. And the reason uh, Michelle and his company came across my radar screen is because as I was looking at Nevada, and I, I've been spending a lot of time in my research here at Nevada because it's such a great jurisdiction. And of course, the, the geological bar is very low. You see assets making great cash flow at half a gram or less even. So a piece of rock the size of your desk has gold in it that weighs about the, the fingernail of your pinky and that produces great cash flow. So that's pretty amazing. So when I looked through Michelle's um, PowerPoint and some of his old press releases, I saw some remarkably high grade uh, numbers there that if this was a fresh deal, had just come to market uh, and, and published those uh, numbers just as they came out of the ground now, I just think the market cap here would be an incredible multiple higher than it is today. Mm -hmm.